You unravel me with a melody. Ezekiel chapter 8 verse 1 and it came to pass in the sixth year of in the sixth month on the fifth day of the month as I sat in my house with the elders of Judah sitting before me that the hand of the Lord God fell upon me there now this is a year and a half roughly from the first vision he received and remember all of those things he did he he went out and laid on his side for 300 and some days for on his other side for 40 days. He cut all his hair off, divided them in three piles equally. He ate that weird Ezekiel bread stuff, right? So a year and a half's passed and God speaks to him again. Now we also see something here. Ezekiel has a house, right? And the elders of Judah, remember they're in Babylon, they have come to his house, and we don't know necessarily what the conversation is, but we do see, as we'll get there from chapter 14 and chapter 20, that this seems to be a regular occurrence. The elders of the, of the, of the body are coming and getting some information from Ezekiel. Hey, what is the Lord saying? What is he speaking? And remember... He's in Babylon. So he's there with these guys, and all of a sudden the Lord speaks to him. And this vision that he gets, and why we're going to do our best to get through all four chapters, is four chapters long. Verse 2 Then I looked, and there was a likeness, like the appearance of fire, from the appearance of his waist downward fire. And from his waist and upward, like the appearance of brightness, like the color of amber, he stretched out the form of a hand and took me by the lock of my hair. And the spirit lifted me up between the earth and heaven and brought me in visions of God to Jerusalem, to the door of the north gate of the inner court where the seat of the image of jealousy was which provokes to jealousy. So obviously his hair's grown back, right? Now, anybody want to sign up for the Lord uh, coming and speaking to you and grabbing you by the hair and yanking you up in the middle of the air and taking you somewhere? Now, again, again, this isn't literal. He's, they just told us he's in his front room. But God is getting his attention, and he takes him to the north gate of the inner court of the temple there is where he sees this image of jealousy. What is that? What is the image of jealousy that provokes God to jealousy? Now, let's just pause for a moment. We're going to find out what it is, but so far in our study in the Old Testament, there's one thing that Israel keeps doing that really, really irritates the Lord. Idolatry, right? And now we see that there's this image that's causing jealousy. Verse 4. And behold, the glory of the Lord God of Israel was there, like the vision that I saw in the plain. So he's, he's seeing something that he's seen before. God's glory in a way. Now remember when we looked at chapter 1? We've never seen anything like that. And it's almost hard to even comprehend and in in, in, in picture in our minds, but that's what he's seeing again. Verse 5. And he said to me, son of man, lift your eyes toward the north. So I lifted my eyes toward the north and there north of the altar gate was the image of jealousy in this entrance. Now I've got a couple of pictures. First picture we want to look at is the temple. So I know that's super hard to look at, hopefully. Uh, but understand the temple, uh, the top is north. So if you see here, um, it says Solomon's North Gate. Can you see that? Okay, now there's a color surrounding that right there. What color is that? Green. green. Okay, so that green, that's the original temple area. That bigger area is when Herod remodeled it, and that's not what we're looking at at this point. We're looking at Solomon's Temple. So that North Gate is where he is. There's one more picture uh, just to see a comparison of what Solomon's temple looked like compared to Herod's remodel. So as you can see, Herod added quite a bit uh, during uh, Jesus' time. And then remember at 70 AD, that was all destroyed by the Romans. 
So it appears that God has taken Ezekiel to this inner court where sacrifices are made on this brazen, brazen altar, and there's an image at the entrance of that gate. Now, the north gate is the area, because the palace would have been just to the north, is where the king would have entered. Uh, and we have a king that designed that temple. Well, he built it, right? His father designed it. What was his name? Solomon, right? Solomon built that temple, and that would have been the gate that he always went in. Uh, but Saul to, Solomon was very guilty of something. He is the king that brought idolatry in to the nation of Israel. Remember, he had a problem with women. 700 wives and 300 concubines. <laughs> and he wanted to make them happy. And so... He married these foreign women that had other gods, and he's the one that all these high places, all that began with Solomon. Now, just a side note, for any of you that are thinking about mar being married or any of you that are married, th there, there's a goal that should ha we should have, right? So as a husband, here's what, my goal is not to love my wife more than anything else in the world. My goal is to love Jesus more than anything else in the world. If you're not married and you're thinking about getting married and you're looking for that special someone, here's a trait that you need to find in them, that they love Jesus more than anything else. Because listen, if they love Jesus more than anything else, they will have no problem loving you, All right? Little premarital marriage advice right in the middle of Ezekiel. Let's go back. So Ezekiel is in this temple of God and the people are blatantly, right, worshiping an image in God's temple. Verse six, furthermore, he said to me, son of man, do you see what they are doing? The great abominations that the house of Israel commits here to make me go far away from my sanctuary. Now turn again and you will see greater abominations. So God's presence is here in this temple. And the reason... Remember, the reason God asked Moses and gave him the design for that tabernacle, and remember, tabernacle is just a, a, a really nice name for a tent. See, he designed that because all, there was three tribes on each, north, south, east, west, and the tabernacle was to be in the middle, and the presence of God was in that tabernacle. So the people could always see that God was dwelling with them. Solomon later built that temple and people could come and worship God. His presence was there. If you read in 1 Kings, there's this amazing event of Solomon dedicating that temple and the spirit of God comes down and there's so much smoke, right, from his presence, the priests can't even do their jobs. This is where people have decided to put other images and worship other gods. And it says God is going to leave his sanctuary because of their great abominations. But there's more, verse 7. So he bought, brought me to the door of the court. And when I looked, there was a hole in the wall. And he said to me, son of man, dig into the wall. And when I dug into the wall, there was a door. And he said to me, go in and see the wicked abominations which are, good, are doing there, they are doing there. Now, before we get too much into this, we all need to understand something. Application number one, you cannot hide anything from God. Okay? Psalm 139, one of my favorite psalms, verses seven through 10. The psalmist writes, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I send to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand shall hold me. There is no place you can go. There is nothing that you can do that God can't go or God cannot see. Now, uh, many years ago, I remember counseling a guy that had a pornography problem. And his desire and struggle was very real. Any of you that know people or have been there yourself know exactly what I'm talking about. And we would meet every week. Uh, and one of the things we would pray for 
and pray for him specifically is that God's spirit would fill him and convict him of that sin. You know, see, there's times that we sin, we know it's sin, but we've made ourselves a little callous to the spirit of God and we just kind of do it and we think that it's okay because God doesn't strike us dead. Well, that sin was destroying him and his marriage and one day we met and he had shared with me that the night before put his family to bed and he went to his computer and he was getting ready to get into it all again. And he said something happened. He started shaking. And the Holy Spirit just convicted him. He shut the computer down. He went to his wife. Now, I'd been encouraging him to share with his wife a struggle. Because, listen, one of the best prayer partners you can ever have is your spouse. And they sat up and prayed, cried, because this was, this was messing up his marriage. And see, something happened that night. I believe he was delivered. And also healing began because he wasn't trying to hide things anymore. See, there are times that we know we're sinning and we get a little callous to it. And then we wonder why things don't progress in our lives and our walk with the Lord. And it's because God wants to deal with things, right? Not that we've got to expose all of our sin to all the world, but we've got to be honest with ourselves. And an amazing work happened. Now, it is sad for some believers that even in the day-to-day, we can be so unconscious of the Spirit of God that lives within us. Think about this for a moment. If we really understood about walking in the Spirit every day, every minute, our lives would permeate Jesus. And not only that, it would keep us out of a lot of trouble. (laughs) So Ezekiel gets a vision into the private areas of these men's lives. Verse 10. So I went in and I saw, and there every sort of creeping thing abominable beast and all the idols of the house of Israel portrayed all around the walls. So Ezekiel is seeing some odd things and it seems odd to us from this description just so we don't want to make any more than what it is. There's a lot of presumption that some of this was pornographic. Uh, yeah, but I want to stick with what the text does tell us and not what it doesn't tell us. But it says every sort of creeping thing, abominable beast and all the idols portrayed around the walls. Now, Romans chapter 1 gives us, I think, a little insight to what this may be. Paul writes this, professing to be wise, they became fools and they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and what? Creeping things. (laughs) See, man decided that worshiping creeping things and animals is wise. Now, think about this logic for a moment. If I see a spider and I decide that that spider is really smart and I see it up there and it's got this web and I thought, man, that thing made that beautiful web. He not only lives in that web, but he uses that web to catch food. Hmm. I'm sure that that spider can help me out with major decisions in my life about what job I should pick. You know, tr- challenges in my marriage, maybe how I should act better. You know, my financial ch- woes. That's what can help me. Now, see, Paul says this in a very nice way. He says, professing to be wise, they became fools. That's a pretty nice way of saying, you know what, you're an idiot, <laughs> right? You think that that animal, that bug, whatever that is, is going to help you. Now, we know that animal cults came from Egypt and they were very prevalent at that time. We know that Solomon married one of Pharaoh's daughters and I'm sure Solomon wanted to make her happy. So I'm sure he made a temple for her religious activities. But we can't blame Solomon solely. 
Because we do know that people have been worshiping cows for centuries, right? Remember, Moses is on the mountain. And Aaron says, bring me all your gold. <laughs> and he makes this golden calf. And when Moses comes back down, he goes, what did you do? And he goes, well, I had this gold. I put it in the fire and a cow came out. <laughs> sure it did. You ever wonder where that term holy cow came from? Yeah, anyway. Now, with all of that, they made idols of these things to worship. Now, let's stop and ask ourselves a question. Is there something in our life that we would not want exposed to the world? Is there something that's going on up here? Is there something we're doing in secret that we would rather not be put on the evening news or put on Instagram or Facebook or social media? See, God was very clear about this. Exodus chapter 20. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath, in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. Verse 5. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me, and what? Keep my commandments. Now see, it, it wasn't like they didn't know. But isn't that how sin works? There's a little bit, you kind of compromise a little here and there. And then, you know, it doesn't happen just overnight. And then as time goes by, you are so into doing something you know you shouldn't be doing. And you feel like you can't get out. Ezekiel verse 11. <clears throat> and there stood before them 70 men of the elders of the house of Israel. In the midst stood Jehazania. Well, yeah, that guy son of Shaphan, and each man had a censer in his hand, and a thick cloud of incense went up. Then he said to me, Son of man, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark, every man in the room of his idols? For they say, the Lord does not see us, and the Lord has forsaken the land. Okay, so we've got something going on here. They, these leaders have these censers, and it's burning, making smoke. Now, this is something the priest did. He brought a censer into not the Holy of Holies, but the outer holy area. And these censers were to burn. This was some religious activity that they are doing. But now understand, they're doing religious activity while they are secretly worshiping idols. Secret sin in the dark room where no one else can see. And yet they wonder why God isn't working in their lives and in their nation. Now, does God know the problems they have? Yeah, of course he does, right? He's God. Now, has God really forsaken the land? Well, there, there's two senses to that. In reality, it's his land, so he's not going anywhere. But has he forsaken or blessed his people? Yeah, he's forsaken that. Why? Well, because they've been disobedient. Did anybody read Leviticus 26 last week? I gave you some homework. All right, now, we saw some, if you read that chapter, go, have it, go back and read it. But what we see there is we have this conditional covenant with the Lord. If you will do this, then God will do this. But if you don't do this, then God's going to do this. And there's a list of a mess of things that I don't think anybody wants and that is what has been happening. God's people have said, no, thank you. I'll do it my way. So the land is left without blessing. Why? Well, because they're disobedient to the covenant that they made with God by their secret sins. Verse 13. And he said to me, turn again, and you will see greater abominations than they are doing. So he brought me to the door of the north gate of the Lord's house, and to my dismay, 
women were sitting there weeping for Tammuz, a greater abomination. What is weeping for Tammuz? Well, the Bible only mentions Tammuz once, and it's right here. And this worship of Tammuz was actually from the Canaanites, right? Remember when God brought Joshua into the land and he said, wipe them out. He said, all their idols, their gods, don't keep any of it. Sadly, that didn't happen completely. Morphing from that, there was a Babylonian god named Demuzi, who was the partner of Ishtar, and then the Greek gods eventually evolved it to Adonis, which was the god of rebirth, the god of nature. See, this was the worship of nature, specifically the four seasons, right? See, after spring and summer, when everything would grow and look beautiful and harvest happened, well, then the leaves turned and things started to die. Well, the worship of Tammuz happened in the fall and winter. Why? Well, because they were praying to this God so that he would bring life back, rebirth, to the land. And this, in a sense, was just their explanation of the four seasons. Now, what are these women weeping about? Well, obviously, the land's dying, but instead of seeking the Lord for their provision, they choose an idol instead. Verse 15. Then he said to me, Have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again, you will see greater abominations than these. So he brought me into the inner court of the Lord's house, and there at the door of the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs toward the temple of the Lord and their faces toward the east. And they were worshiping the sun toward the east. Now remember, so the... If we had, remember that picture, the, the inner court would have been the brazen altar where all the sacrifices were made and then the entrance to where the table of showbread was, the, the lamp and the incense, and then that small room in the back was, was the Holy of Holies. So they, are, they had their backs to the door. Remember there was two columns, Boaz and, Yeah. Other guy, and they're facing the sun, sun rising in the east, and they're facing worshiping the sun with their back to the Lord, and they're right there in front of the temple. That's what he's seeing here. Now, in 2 Kings chapter 21, we know that Manasseh, like a really bad king of Judah, set up idols in that inner court. Later, his grandson Josiah comes along, 2 Kings 23, and he takes them all away. So somehow, these idols have worked their way back into the temple. Now, the horrible thing about this is that these men, again, they have their backs, in a sense, to God and worshiping God's creation. Now, not to mention, we need to understand something. In this area here, not everybody was allowed in. This was an area for priests only. Priest of God with their back to the Holy of Holies, worshiping the Son. Verse 17, and he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Is it a trivial thing to the house of Judah to commit the abominations which they commit here? For they have filled the land with violence. Then they have returned to provoke me to anger. Indeed, they put the branch to their nose. Now, there's a couple of things to notice here. First of all, because of the sin, God says they have filled the land with violence. See, they're sinning in a spiritual sense and in a religious sense. Spiritually, they're just disobeying God's commands. Religiously, they're making their disobedience a spiritual thing. The social structure is failing. Nations fall when people reject God. We see social chaos, injustice, bad decisions all come from a life without God. And any of you that have gone down that road a few times know exactly what I'm talking about. 
It just seems like things can't get any worse and they get worse. And God's like, like listen, you're sinning, you need to stop. <laughs> now, it says they put a branch to their nose. Now, there's something interesting about this. This phrase obviously is showing some kind of contempt toward God, but we don't see that phrase anywhere else in the Bible either. So there's a few things some smart guys have come up with. First of all, it may mean that they're just snubbing their nose at God, right? Snub. It may mean some sort of act of worship to this God to moose. Or some think that it's just a sign of taking something of God's creation like a plant and smelling it and saying, oh, this is how we worship, right? But to the Lord, it's a stench. You're worshiping my creation and not me. Verse 18. Therefore, I will also act in fury. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. And though they cry in my ears with a loud voice, I will not hear them. In a sense, God's patience has run out. His judgment is coming. And if you're crying for mercy, God's not having it, not listening Chapter 9, those who have charge over the city draw near, each with a deadly weapon in his hand. Now, we're going to see these six men that are called to inflict this judgment upon Jerusalem. Now, I was struggling a bit here because the text calls out and says that they're men, not angels. But as we go through this, we'll obviously see that these are some kind of angelic being that are going to carry out God's instructions. Now, one thing we must remember here, and I think it's very interesting and sometimes I think we kind of check out of it. We, when it comes to the spiritual thing, we always, in the church, we tend to stay away from it or things get super, super weird, right? There's no middle ground of knowing what is actually going on. But listen, spiritually, there is a battle going on. Now, with that, concerning angels, we need to understand something. Angels are not at your or my beck and call to do whatever we ask them to do. We are never instructed to pray to them or to ask them to do anything. Here's what we are instructed to do and who we have access to. God Almighty, right? And then we allow God to do the instruction and the work through his angelic host. Verse two, and suddenly six men came from the direction of the upper gate, which faces north, each with his battle ax in his hand. One man among them was clothed with linen and had a rider's inkhorn at his side. They went in and stood beside the brazen altar. So they come in right in front of the, right in front of the temple, the brazen altar where all the sacrifices happen. They're standing right there. Verse 3, now the glory of God of Israel had gone up from the cherub where it had been to the threshold of the temple. So now all of a sudden God is standing at the doorway. He is called to the man clothed with linen who had the writer's inkhorn at his side. And the Lord said to him, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, and put a mark on the foreheads of the men who sigh and cry over the abominations that are done within it. God's presence not in the Holy of Holies anymore, now at the door of the temple. And he's come and he calls the man with the inkwell, says, listen, I want you to go mark everybody that is still following me, that is still upset about what I'm upset about. Now, this word mark in the Hebrew is only used three times in the Old Testament. It's the word T-A-U. I'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it, but when you write it, it looks like a T, <laughs> or a cross. Now, I don't want to make something out of nothing, but I think it's very interesting that God would use that mark to mark his people that they would be safe. Exodus chapter 12. Remember God told the children of Israel to sacrifice the lamb and put the lamb on the doorpost so that when the death angel came through, the firstborn in their home wouldn't be spared. Revelation chapter 7, there were 144,000 that had a mark on them and they could not be touched by the Antichrist. And then of course, as we studied, Satan has his counterfeit 
Revelation 13, and men take a mark to buy or sell. Interesting scenario there. But God in his sovereignty, here's what we need to take away from this. God in his sovereignty is more than capable of taking care of his people. Verse 5. To the others, he said in my hearing, go after him through the city and kill. Do not let your eyes spare nor have any pity. Utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, and, but do not come near anyone on whom is the mark and, the, and begin at my sanctuary. So they began with the elders who were before the temple. So this judgment begins at the temple. This leadership that was secretly sinning, these elders that are outside worshiping, these women that are in the courts weeping for this God. God is judging the blatant sin of Judah, and it all begins at the temple of God. Now there's some correlation with something Peter tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. For us in this day, he says, for the time has come for the judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? See, Peter's reminding us that God's judgment comes to everyone. See, he begins with his house, his people. Now understand something. For the believer, this is corrective judgment. For the unbeliever, it will be consequences that should draw them to repentance. But if man does not repent, it will be eternal judgment. And Ezekiel has shown that no one that is guilty will escape this judgment. Verse 7, then he said to them, defile the temple and fill the courts with the slain. Go out. And they went out and killed in the city. Now remember in chapter 6, God promised that he would defile all those pagan altars that were in all the high places. And now God is even defiling his own temple because of this sin. Verse 8, so it was that while they were killing them, I was left alone. And I fell on my face and I cried out and I said, Oh, Lord God, will you destroy all the remnant of Israel in pouring out your fury on Jerusalem? Now again, remember what we are reading. This is a vision to Ezekiel about God's judgment that will come upon Judah. Israel, the nation of Israel, the northern tribes have already been judged. And if our timeline is correct, this is about five years before Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon come in, and they've had enough, and they wipe them out. But Ezekiel is seeing this vision of death, even though God has already shown him that he will protect a remnant, right? He's even just seen this man with an inkwell go out and mark people, and they're not supposed to be touched. But Ezekiel is so brokenhearted for his people, he's like, how can anybody even survive this? Verse 9, then he said to me, the iniquity of the house of Israel and Judah is exceedingly great, and the land is full of bloodshed and the city full of perversity. For they say, the Lord has forsaken the land and the Lord does not see. And as for me, and as for me also, my eye will neither spare, nor will I have pity, nor will I recompense their deeds on their own head. Just then, the man clothed with linen, who had the inkhorn at his side, reported back and said, I have done as you have commanded me. So God reminds Ezekiel that he has been preaching. What he has been preaching is coming, and it is well deserved. The righteous are marked and sealed. The wicked have received what is due. And there is, remember, it hasn't happened yet. But there is no hope for the wicked unless they repent. Chapter 10. Then I looked, and there in the firmament was above the head of the cherubim, there appeared something like a sapphire stone, having the appearance and the likeness of a throne. Then he spoke to the man clothed with linen and said, Go in among the wheels under the cherub, fill your hands with the coals of fire, and among the cherubim, and scatter them all over the city. And he went as I watched. 
Now, again, this is this this is this vision, again, that he saw from chapter 1. And one of those men in linen is told to go get some coals from the wheel and scatter those coals all over Jerusalem. Now, remember what God has already shown Ezekiel. Remember when he shaved his head? A third of that was people were killed by the sword. A third by fire. A third scattered, Right? So now the, another vision of this fire, this burned judgment. Verse 3, now the cherubim was standing on the south side of the temple when the man went in, and the cloud filled the inner court. Then the glory of the Lord went up from the cherubim and paused over the threshold of the temple, and the house was filled with the cloud, and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And the sound of the wings of the cherubim was heard even in the outer court, like a voice of the, Al the Almighty when he speaks. When it happened, he commanded the man clothed in linen, saying, Taking, Take fire from among the wheels, from among the cherubim. And he went in and stood beside the wheels. Now, what we're seeing here is another just interesting vision of the Shekinah glory of God. Now, I have a list of all of the times that we have seen that through the Old Testament. We will not go over those, but I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, New Testament, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18. Different times that God has shown his glory in this kind of way. Now, what we are seeing. What we are seeing here is a departure of the presence of God from the temple of God in Jerusalem. This departure happens as God's judgment comes. Look at verse 7. And the cherub stretched out his hand from among the cherubim to the fire that was among the cherubim, and he took some of it out and put it into the hands of the man clothed with linen, who took it out, took it and went out. And the chair appeared to have the form of a man's hands under his wings. Now we've got a cherub and a cherubim here. And we're going to get a real detailed description here like we did in chapter one. But have you ever noticed that in medieval art and some of the earlier stuff, what is a cherubim always portrayed as? A little fat baby, right? Where, where did that come from, right? <laughs> I don't know, but it's super weird. But all, all I know is that these guys that are described here have got to be pretty amazing, right? Uh, and it's something like we've never seen before. Now, verses 9 through 14 will give this detailed description as it does in chapter 1. Now, I'm going to let you read that on your own for time's sake. Verse 14 says, each one had four faces. The first face was a face of a cherub, second face of a man, third a face of a lion, the fourth a face of an eagle. Now there's an inf interesting difference in this description than from Revelation chapter 4. And there's also a different face that's described here from uh, Ezekiel chapter 1. So for sort of homework tonight, I'll let you research that and you can give me a text, let me know what you find. But, but it's interesting, but we're going to keep moving. Verse 15, and when the cherubim were lifted up, this was the living creature that I saw at the river Chabar, right? Chapter one. And when the cherubim went, the wheels went beside them. And when the cherubim lifted up their wings to mount up from the earth, the same wheels also did not turn from beside them. When the cherubim stood still, the, still the wheels stood still. And when one was lifted up, the other lifted itself up. For the spirit of the living creature was within them. So this throne vision is the same as chapter 1. Uh, it's bringing the judgment of Judah. And something else happens. Verse 18. Then the glory of the Lord departed from the threshold of the temple and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted their wings, mounted up from the earth in my sight, and when they went out, the wheels were beside them, and they stood at the door of the east gate of the Lord's house, and the glory of the God of Israel was above them. So God's presence has now left the temple. It's now over the east gate, the same place where these 25 priests were looking and worshiping the sun. 
This is the living creature I saw, verse 20, the God of Israel by the river Chabar, and I knew they were cherubim. Each one had four faces, each had four wings. The likeness of the hands of man were under their wings, and the likeness of their faces was the same as the faces which I had seen at the river Chabar. Their appearance of their persons, they each went straight forward. Again, confirming what he's seen before. Chapter 11. Then the Spirit lifted me up and brought me to the east gate of the Lord's house, which faces eastward, and there at the door of the gate were the 25 men among whom I saw... Jazaniah, the son of Azur, and Palatian, the son of Benaniah, princes of the people. Now, two of these of the 25 men that were named, but it's not the same Jahaziah, yeah, that guy. They've got different fathers if you want to make a little note. So here's what some may think. This might be referring to the guys that Ezekiel is sitting with in his front room back in Babylon. Or it's another Jehaniza, and uh, it's one of the 25 that are worshiping the sun god. Verse 2, And he said to me, Son of man, These are the men who devise iniquity and give wicked counsel in the city, who say, the time is not near to build houses. This city is a cauldron, and we are the meat. Therefore, prophesy against them. Prophesy, son of man. So these men, these wicked men, these sun worshipers, are preaching, in a sense, all is well. Go ahead and build your houses. Invest in our society. We are safe like meat hidden in a cauldron. Now that's totally against everything that Jeremiah is preaching and everything that Ezekiel is preaching. Verse 5, Then the Spirit of the Lord fell upon me, and he said to me, Speak. Thus says the Lord, thus you have said, O house of Israel, for I know the things that come into your mind. You have multiplied your slain in the city and you have filled its streets with the slain. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, your slain whom you have laid in the midst, they are the meat and the city is the cauldron. But I shall bring you out of the midst of it. You you have feared the sword and I will bring the sword upon you, says the Lord God. God is holding these men in judgment for their wicked ways and their counsel, and violence has filled the city because of them. Remember, we talked about that earlier. But instead of the people being the meat safely stored in the cauldron, like they're saying, God is saying they're going to get devoured. The city that you so greatly trust in is going to be destroyed, and the fear of being conquered by the enemy that you have had for so long is actually going to be brought from God himself. Verse 9, and I will bring you out of the midst and I will deliver you into the hands of strangers and execute judgments on you. You shall fall by the sword. I will judge you at the border of Israel and then you shall know that I am the Lord. I don't know about you, but I think that it is much better to know God as my Savior and Lord than as my judge. See, we have seen the sword, we've seen the fire, and now we're seeing the scattering. Verse 11, this city shall not be your cauldron, nor shall you be the meat in its midst. I will judge you at the border of Israel, for you shall know that I am the Lord God, for you have not walked in my statutes nor executed my judgments, but you have done according to the customs of the Gentiles, which are all around you. So this analogy of being safe like meat in a cauldron is actually corrected by God. God will judge. Why? Because God's people have not followed God's instructions. Here they're called out for something that I think we need to be very careful of. And this is very applicable for us today. He says, but have being, have you have done according to the customs of the Gentiles, which are all around you. What is God saying? He's saying you are more concerned about being like the world out there than being who I've called you to be. See, is there something worldly in your life 
that you have may, attempted to make godly? That's what they're doing, right? They're doing all the spiritual stuff. They're sinning and they're making it religious. Oh, well, God must approve of this. See, Ezekiel was allowed to see those secret sins of the leadership in Jerusalem. They were burning the incense, doing the religious stuff, but worshiping something else, another God. And I would pray, and hopefully you would pray right at this moment, that God would convict us if we have any idols that we are worshiping in our lives and we think that it's God or we're making it godly, making it religious, and it's not God at all. Jesus said in John 17 that as he was praying for us, he said, listen, we're to be in the world, but not of it. See, as believers, we are not called to go live in a commune somewhere and all be super spiritual and just remove the world around us, right? He didn't call us to be a monk and sit cross-legged and hold our thumbs and fingers and sing kumbaya. That's not what we're called to do. We are called to go out there and represent Jesus. But it's really difficult to represent Jesus when we're just like everybody else. If you are acting like the world, you have nothing to offer the world. Verse 13. Now it happened while I was prophesying that Palladia, the son of Benaiah, died. Then I fell on my face and I cried with a loud voice and I said, Ah, Lord God, will you make a complete end of the remnant of Israel? So Ezekiel sees one of these leaders die in his vision. Now, maybe this is one of those leaders that refused to hear God's warning. Ezekiel again questions with all of this instruction and judgment, how can anyone survive? Even a remnant that you may have told me is going to be there, but you know, sometimes we get something in front of our face and we can't see behind it. We can't see around it. We just focus on that one thing and we don't see God actually working. So God responds, look at verse 14. The Lord came to me saying, Son of man, your brethren, your relatives, your countrymen, and all of the house of Israel in its entirety are those about whom the inhabitants of Jerusalem have said, Get far away from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. See, God told Judah initially to submit to Babylon, and they refused. And so God brought Babylon to them. We had that first invasion when Daniel and his buddies were taken. We had the second invasion when Ezekiel and about 10,000 people were taken. And the third is coming. At this time, many still believed in Jerusalem that Egypt was going to come and save them and defeat Babylon. They had false securities in their city, false securities in their defenses, false securities in their neighboring nations that Babylon hadn't dealt with yet. Why? Well, because they're still in Jerusalem. If you want to make a little note, write down Jeremiah chapter 24, verses 1 through 7. These people think that they're better than everybody else. All those exiles... Well, they're the ones that God is bringing judgment on. We're still here, so we are okay. But God is reminding Ezekiel that the exiles, him, God has not forgotten them. Look at verse 16. Therefore say, thus says the Lord God, although I have cast them far among, off among the Gentiles, and although I have scattered them among the countries, yet I shall be a little sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. See, God is keeping his remnant, his remnant. And it's not, 
the people that are in Jerusalem. Verse 17, therefore, thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the peoples, assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will, what? Give you the land of Israel. See, the scattered remnant is what will be brought back. Brought back to the land of Israel. Now, whose land is that to give? It's God's. It's God's land. It will always be God's land. It is not Israel's. Verse 18, they will go from there and they will take away all its detestable things and all its abominations from there. So again, there will never again be a problem of idol worship for Israel after this judgment. Many times we believe that judgment for our sin is the end. And we know that the end isn't the end, right? <laughs> We've just studied Revelation. We go through something really hard and we this is the end. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is not the end. Hebrews chapter 6, 12 verse 6 tells us, for whom the Lord loves, he what? Chastens and he scourges every son whom he receives. See, God disciplines his children. Why? Well, because sadly, this is how you and I learn. <laughs> If only we could just follow the instructions and do what we're told, things would be a lot easier. But this is not just a New Testament principle. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12 tells us, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. We gotta understand something. Love demands correction. So this scattered remnant will return to the land. And is that it? Is that it? No, verse 19. He says, then I will give them one heart and I will put a new spirit within them. I will take away the stony heart out of their flesh and I will give them a heart of flesh. And they will walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, and do them, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God. Now, we're, we're going to stretch this one and, and make this. We're going to, because here's how, it ha here's how it works. One heart, right? Over and over again, we are taught in the New Testament about having unity in Jesus, right? Unity. Does that mean we're going to agree on everything? No, because we're all different, but in Christ, we can be unified. This new spirit, right? What happened? Well, the Holy Spirit that resided in this temple and that is working its way out because of judgment, now because of the Holy Spirit resides in you and I. Replace a stony heart with a heart of flesh. See, that heart of stone now is soft and pliable and teachable and learns. Israel had this opportunity when their Messiah came and they rejected him. So sadly, most Jews have not experienced what Ezekiel is prophesying at this moment. But for you and I that have accepted Christ, we learn and grow as we walk in the spirit and not Walking in the flesh, Galatians 5.16. This old man is replaced with a new man, Ephesians 4.24, Colossians 3.10. And in all of that, you and I get to become a new creation, 2 Corinthians 5.17. Verse 21, but as for those hearts who follow the desire of their detestable things and their abominations. I will recompense their deeds on their own heads, says the Lord God. Sowing and reaping is a principle of life. Whether you're a believer or not a believer, you will be judged for your sins or you can choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. Verse 22 
So the cherubim lifted up their wings and with the wheels beside them and the glory of God of Israel was high above them and the glory of the Lord went up from the midst of the city and stood on the mountain which is on the east side of the city. So Ezekiel has now witnessed the spirit of God moving from the Holy of Holies to the threshold of the temple to outside to the eastern gate and now on the mountain east of the city. You know where that, what is there? You know where that is? It's the Mount of Olives. Do you think there's any significance to Ezekiel's prophecy here? Where will Jesus return? The Mount of Olives. Verse 24. Then the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to those in captivity, and the vision that I had seen went up from me, so I spoke to those in captivity all the things that the Lord God has shown me. So now Ezekiel's back in his living room with these elders. Now, did he black out for an hour? <laughs> you know, where the guy's going, Ezekiel, dude, what's wrong with you? Wake up. Or did he see this? And instantaneously, he's back. I don't know. I would guess it was more instantaneous. But he gets to now pour out to the people in captivity, to the guys that are sitting in his living room, what he has just experienced. Bringing not only clarity to God's plan, but hope to these exiles here in Babylon. Child of God.